first of England. Almost 300 years later, in 1997, the process of dissolving this union was begun, and now Scotland once again has its own parliament. Gate, one of the most historic areas of Edinburgh, has been chosen as the site for the new building, and this is where the original Scottish Royal Court and Parliament were held. Hey, Colin, I've walked up and down Canongate so many times in the last 20 years or so, I guess I can't remember what was here before. There's nothing memorable about Canongate. What was here? Well, it's funny you should say that because <laughs> I think if you had walked up here six months ago, you still wouldn't recognise yeah, it. Right. This place has changed so much. Yeah. Um, basically, on this side of the site, where we are at the moment, which was originally the, the Scottish and Newcastle yeah. Brewery headquarters, there were a series of nondescript buildings running down right. Canningate, yeah. turning along Abbey, Abbey Wine. Right. And um, basically you can see the Hollywood Abbey behind yeah. us, and which is now the, the site of the yeah. palace. Um, and basically the big hole that's over here yeah. was uh, covered by various uh, brewery buildings. On the far side of the site, um, you've got Queensbury House, which has right. been retained as part of the development. But also in front of that, there were some quite nice gardens and uh, some wings of building and some gatehouses down, kind of formally kind of uh, surrounding a gateway that went out onto Hollywood Road. Yeah. But all that is obviously all that seriously history. gone now. <laughs> it's history, yeah. So Cannon Gate is paralleled with us here on the right. Yes. And so the houses were coming from Cannon Gate this way. Yes, right? yeah. basically what we had is we had quite prestigious buildings fronting onto the Cannon yeah. Gate. Um, and they would have had properties that ran basically the width of the, the building at the frontage but all the way back to Hollywood Road which is really? what, what you can oh, see as the point oh, right, so yeah. big long properties and basically each, each property was kind of a self-contained unit they had, their, they had their own animals at the back uh, they'd butcher their own animals right. they'd uh, make their own beer um, basically everything that they needed they could do in their own property you know right. so it's quite good so beer's been big on this site for a throughout then. There's a tradition of brewing here going back, well obviously yeah. the monks, the monks yeah. were kind of partial to yeah. a few points right, yeah. but obviously from the evidence that we're getting in the ground, uh, we're getting a lot of malting pits, kilns, right, things like yeah. that, which all relate to kind of brewing and, and brewing. Yeah, finding out yeah the the lovely supply of clean yeah. water here which is an unusual thing and of course in, in, in the medieval period the water generally was so horrible yeah. that people generally drank beer rather than water yeah. anyway because it, it was today. much safer. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> Column's team has had a field day and the key to their success was knowing where to dig. So the historians were called in to look at the documentary evidence. And we started off with the earliest decent map of Edinburgh, which is that completed by Gordon of Rothermay. Oh, I know the map you mean, yeah. It's seen in every <laughs> yeah, shop in the right. high street, and it's a very good map. That's this, this one here, yeah. That's it. It's a combination of an attempt to show a sort of three-dimensional perspective. Right, yeah. It's known as the Rothermere perspective, in mm. fact. And it shows a series of houses coming off the uh, cannon gate mm. and gardens at the back. And the gardens are quite elaborate, parterre, not garden types. Mm -hmm. The housing itself is quite distinctive in as much as the houses are gable on to the street frontage, uh, okay. maximising the space sure. available. And that wasn't the only ingenious method used to make the most of the available land. And you've so, got yeah. two storeys in an attic level looking out onto the street itself and as the land terraces down nice. you get an extra <laughs> a bonus floor yeah. as you go back down the, down the slope. And this really is the blueprint as apparent mm. uh, in the 1647 layout of the city. Mm. Now our first volunteer, Bob, is about to look into the history of one of Canongate's houses in detail, Queensbury House. And as an archivist from the National Archives of Scotland, it should be a bit of a change for him to get his hands dirty. But his first job is to find out who the Queensbury's were. It was the second Duke of Queensbury um, who was the, the principal architect of the Act of Union under Queen Anne. Um, and we feel that this, this building has particular significance in that whole process. It's very close to Holyrood Palace. Um, Did any of the political debate about the Act of Union take place in, in this house? Well, we think that's very likely. Um, one, one of the documents refers to a public dining room opposed to his private dining room, and we think that may, may be where a, a lot of these um, discussions um, so you may have taken place. A lot of the top politicians um, in Scotland at the time coming to this building to discuss the pros and cons of, of union. Yes, very much so. And our second volunteer, Jackie, is finding out about Scotland's Parliament, which existed before the Union with England in 1707. She's leaving her museum job behind to dig around in the National Archives and get a look at some of the original acts of this early government. 
So how old is that? These ones date from the early 1470s, so they're over 500 years old now. Right, and, and what is it it's written in? It's very difficult to read. Well, it's called secretary hand, and it's just the standard hand used at the time. This is actually reasonably neat for the time, but um, for instance, you, know, you can see the long S's there, uh, rather than an S like you'd have today. It looks more like an F, mm -hmm. and lots of letters like T's and C's look the same. So what language is this written in? This is in Scots, um, which is the language that people spoke at the time, obviously. Um, it's actually quite... Uh, it's actually quite novel for the period for, for records to be written in Scots in the vernacular rather than Latin. Uh, it's actually an example of where the Scottish Parliament was rather ahead of the English one because they were still <laughs> using Latin then. Meanwhile, I'm finding out how Gordon and his team have been overlaying the maps to look at how the area has developed over the last 350 years. Understanding the evolution of a site can save the archaeologists a lot of time. The next sort of major stage in the uh, evolution of the site occurred with the arrival of the Queensbury House. Now you'll see mm. Queensbury House later on and it is to be uh, retained within the plan of the new Parliament right. building. That's this building here with... It's uh, turned red. <laughs> An embarrassment. <laughs> with, a, with a large and formalised garden behind it. Yeah. And it's very much imposed onto the 17th century layout. You can mm. see much of that is still as it was in 1647. This is towards the latter stage of the, of the mm. 17th century. So Queensbury House is to be made into offices for the Parliament's civil servants. However, it still has a lot of features which can help tell the story of its chequered history. A townhouse for the Earl of Queensbury at the time of the Union with England. An army barracks during the Napoleonic Wars. A house of refuge for drunken women. And finally, a geriatric hospital. All of which makes it difficult to imagine its 17th century splendour and suites of connecting rooms, known as an enfilade. However, Tom has some pictures of similar houses. Um, this is a Holyrood house. Um, this is very much the same sort of enfilade as, yes. as, as you look Similar down. Similar design as this would have been. Yes, indeed. Yeah. It must have been a splendid house. It was um, probably the largest private townhouse ever built in Scotland, let alone Edinburgh. Um, the suite of rooms we're in at the moment, the enfilade, was 45 metres long, which is very long even for a country house. Yeah. The next sort of significant map saw the arrival of the so-called Lothian Hut. Now, this was another mansion built here uh, with a turning circle and a, a fine sort of carriageway oh, access yes. from the cannon gate down towards it, and again, gardens leading that's out. A hell of a hut, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's it. The Lothian Hut doesn't really do it justice, <laughs> you know? And uh, again, this was probably the last gasp of what you might call aristocratic investment right. at that mm. point of the city, which was there really because of the Parliament stroke palace stroke mm. Old Abbey, yeah. which of course was off to the right mm. there. So when Parliament left, so did the money, and the area went downhill from then on. Pat Dennison has the documents which tell the story. In number three Horsewind, there were 75 people living it, who had once there'd been just one or two families. Mm. And, and no lawyers and accountants. No lawyers <laughs> and accountants, no. And indeed, these houses had no water supply, so there's no water closets, mm. no, no sinks I and see. you have literally hundreds of people mm. sharing uh, an outside tap and they also took to the practice in the 19th century of um, collecting human manure and animal manure and laying it on the streets to dry prior to selling it really yes <laughs> <laughs> so it was pretty pretty yes. disgusting it mm. really was Meanwhile, back at the archives, Jackie's finding out how renewed interest in the history of Scottish rule means that all the parliamentary acts are being transcribed and put on the computer. It's all being translated. What you have is a, called a parallel translation. So you'll have the Scots on one side of the screen, or the Latin, as it may be on other occasions, and then English on the other side, so that anybody can read it. Are there any things that you're coming across that don't have a modern translation or an exact translation? Yes, I mean, sometimes we just have to leave them because there is no uh, translation. There are also lots of... You know, legal terminology, uh, which is Scots legal terminology, you can't really translate that into English because it has a specific meaning to Scotland. Uh, whopping shores are a good example of that, something called a whopping shores, when people gather together uh, at a time of war to uh, they got all their weapons literally into one place so everybody was ready for the war. You can't really translate that word, it's just a Scots word. I mean, you, 
uh, you just have to leave it as it is, really. And I'm finding out how, in the 19th century, the decline of Canongate continued. But Queensbury House remained a refuge for women who had more than a wee dram. The safe accommodation and reformation of females addicted to habits of drunkenness. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a wonderful area, isn't it? Mm. But yeah. I suppose the major, major changes come with gradually the eastern end of the site is brought up by, mm. by Youngest Brewery. And Lothian Hut, which had been quite exceptional, that becomes part of the brewery. Maria. It's used as a malting mm. floor. Uh, with, that was their magnificent dining room. It's about 72 mm. feet long, becomes a malting floor. And really, by the late 19th century, this is what the site is like, totally industrialised at the East End. Is that the brewery? Uh, yes, the whole brewery, the whole brewery yeah. site, Queensbury House is here. Mm. With all those alcoholic women yep. there. Yes, Very handy for the brewery, aren't yep. they? Back in Queensbury House itself, Bob's looking for original features, pre-breweries. And what once we've um, stripped off all of this plaster back to the stonework, um, will then be ready to go about the recording process. And the recording process, what does that involve? What, what are you hoping to find out? Well, we're looking at things that I'd call salient features, which are, um, as you can see here, blocked features, like this, this is a blocked window, mm. and this is a, a little squinch going through the corner, a little viewing um, hole and we'll basically measure every single stone um, very carefully yeah. and, and plot it on, onto a drawing. And together with the maps, they'll be able to chart how this house has evolved. According to the map evidence, only one building, number 12, a tenement near to Queensbury House, has stood the test of time from the 17th century to the present day. I'll be making my own assessment of what's left of it later, but first, Jackie. She's been finding out about the first parliament held here in Canongate. The 75 members from the three Scottish regions came together twice a year to discuss matters of importance and form acts which govern Scotland. This small act here is dealing with uh, the marriage of the king's sister in, in the early 1470s. Um, so the making arrangements for that, that might entail So, so taxation. Did, did royal marriages have to go through parliament? Exactly, because these are diplomatic and political events. Uh, it's not simply a matter of a of the, of the princess deciding who she wants to marry. It's a diplomatic uh, and financial tra transaction, usually with another country. Did that go for the king, king or queen as well? Did they have to go mm -hmm. before parliament? Very often, particularly because uh, if you wanted to arrange a marriage, you'd, you'd have to have uh, uh, an embassy sent to the continent, which involved large amounts of money. So ta uh, tax would have to be granted, and that always had to have permission right. of parliament. Right. So you couldn't just stand up and say, I want to marry this princess, and I want... No, no, you no. couldn't. Uh, really, it boils down to the financial aspect. Ultimately, <laughs> the people at Parliament could say, we're not giving you the money to, to, to arrange this marriage. Go and find somebody cheaper. <laughs> yeah, quite. <laughs> I mean, the archaeology has been quite exciting, really. Mm. Um, we've, we've covered about nearly a thousand years of archaeology wow. uh, in the three metres yeah. that we've excavated. Yeah. It's quite a deep site at yeah. one end. At the front end, it's, it's basically been terraced away by all the, the large-scale construction yeah. that's happened over the last four or five hundred years but at the back we've had these deep soil deposits which have preserved kind of a, a glimpse of what the past was like at the frontage and of course all the interesting things were happening at the frontage right. and at the back you get all the rubbish and uh, detritus and all yeah. the, uh, I think I know all the crap being thrown yeah. out the back here yeah yeah and we've had all the culverts and everything taking all the, the human effluent let's say right, yeah. from the front out to the back here mm -hmm. but going through that's very interesting believe it or not yeah. Um, no, I do believe you. <laughs> it's, uh, we've, we've, we've had quite a few rubbish pits with the back here, which have acted like uh, little time capsules. Yeah. So fossilising the, the events that have been happening kind of through time right, yeah. at the frontage here. So but a lot of archaeology is rubbish, I keep being told. Oh, it certainly <laughs> is, yeah. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> and it seems that medieval rubbish may have attracted some unusual household pests. And he that slays a wolf, than or other at any other time, he shall have of each, each householder within the parish that the wolf is slain within one penny. So he'd get a penny from every householder within the parish that he lived. Uh, so really quite a lucrative business for, for somebody at the time. And if it happens any wolf in, uh, to come in the country that uh, which in is gotten thereof, the country shall be ready and each householder to hunt them under the pain foresaid. And he that slays ain wolf shall bring the head to the sheriff bailey or baron and he shall be debtor to the slayer for the sum foresaid. Well, back to the rubbish, and I get to see what they do with it. And it involves getting togged up like a North Sea fisherman and dabbling in a flotation tank. 
Are you sure this is archaeology? <laughs> Last time we had that, is it? Well, uh, so what are we going to put in there? Well, we've got these samples which we'll take on site. Right, if you know where to go, you'll start seeing goodies appearing in front of your very eyes. Well, these are the sorts of things we're after. Like yeah. These small bits of charcoal, and we frequently get cereal grains and mm. weed seeds. And these can tell you about the sorts of things that have been, people have been eating on the site. What would surprise you most? One of my favourite found was the um, 15th century banana they've recently found in <laughs> banana skin they found in London. Really? Do they have bananas in well, there? Apparently. <laughs> Slowly as the water recedes, you see all the, the heavier items mm -hmm. that didn't float over the weir. Slowly being able to identify bits of oyster Eating shell, nice periwinkles, limpets, fishbone. Oh, like yeah. a cod bone, that yeah, yeah. fish vertebrae. And here's some they cleaned and dried earlier. Cow's teeth, dice, pins, nails, barley, and bits of pottery. All of which tell the archaeologists something about the medieval way of life. I was speaking to the bone person the other day, the bone specialist. She said she, <laughs> she found a lot, of, a lot of dogs and cats. Oh, yeah. And she'll be looking for things like yeah. butchery marks on those, because in the medieval period they were big on skinning dogs and cats with the pelts. Really? And Bob's investigations have uncovered a large oven with a story to tell about human butchery. It does link in with one of the more, more, more gruesome um, historical tales that we have. What um, was that? <laughs> well, the, uh, the second Duke of Queensbury, who built all of the extensions onto the building, his, he had a, a, a mad son who was kept locked up in Queensbury House. Oh, right. And uh, what, apparently one day when the family were at court, the son managed to escape from his room and made his way down to the kitchens. And they returned from court and found him um, roasting one of the kitchen boys on a spit. He was quite possibly in one. The lunatic son had escaped from his room yeah. and uh, while they were out and came down and cooked one of the servant boys. <laughs> That's right. And he was, he was found actually turning the spit, possibly he, with the boy on it. For yeah. Sunday lunch or anything. Yeah. <laughs> Remember building number 12 on the computer chart, which had been in existence since at least 1647? Well, Colum's team were outside Queensbury House investigating it. You know, you're actually standing on a 13th century wall just oh, as we Oh, sorry, speak. shouldn't I be doing this? <laughs> no, it's okay. Sorry. It's all recorded. So if we come right up to the front here. And for them, for it's the a crucial spot. Way. The yes. only place on the site where they've got to see some of the original street. So this is actually Cannon Gate that you're standing on now. Yes, about maybe 10 or 11 hundred years ago. Yeah. I kind of noticing it's lower. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the Cannon Gate basically started off really as a dirt track probably up through here. Yeah. And, and that's what I'm standing on, this just this soil here. Right. So I'm standing on what people would have walked on nearly a thousand mm. years ago. But this here, is the original curb, is this it? This is the curb now in the I later see. medieval period. And uh, they've stolen this piece of ground. And this yeah. is very common in medieval yeah. towns that people like we just, every time they rebuild the house, they stuck another bit uh, out. Yeah. Yeah? But this curb was probably put in here to stop them doing that. Oh, I see. But it's quite amazing. I've never seen this on a, in a medieval borough mm. in Scotland, and I've done quite a few. And as we walk sort of down through here, what? Yeah. We? So basically, now you're in the yard of yeah. what we think is a metalworking area. Right. And this would have been at the front of a prestigious building that would have stood just yeah. along where Simon is there. Mm -hmm. And so they, they're basically kind of worked metal at the front here and then sold it on to mm. people as they were passing. I think they were making horseshoes because we found one. Oh, excellent, yeah. And uh, here we have a, this is the base of a hearth. Yeah, that can see. It's clinkery, isn't it? Yeah, there's a small cinder mm. coming out of it, like that. Oh. And uh, if we were lucky, you might even find a bit of slag. And um, what, what, what stage are we talking about now? We're probably about 13th, 14th century oh, wow. again, here. Yeah, excellent. So. And uh, you, you like this, Rory. This is, um, this is a... I love it. A latrine. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> now I've gone off it. So it's a 19th century is it? latrine tank, yeah. Wow. And um, this is part of the... It just probably goes with some of the walls that you yeah. see still standing mm. around us here. But um, basically this would have been used as a kind of an outside toilet. Now, how do you know that, then? Um, we found some pretty nasty okay, stuff okay, inside okay. there. <laughs> <laughs> and some of the artefacts found here have never been seen in Scotland before, 
indicating trade with Europe and showing that the family who lived here were very affluent. Um, it's, it's a very nice object. And, uh, now, uh, what is this? This is, is it, a carpet it, board. Marble or something? It's, it's papier mache. It's papier mache? Oh, yeah. It's, it's painted. Pa it's actually quite heavy. Yes. But not as heavy as it would be if it was a, a rock, yeah. is it? It's broken in half. Oh, good. I didn't do that, did I? <laughs> it was broken already. <laughs> I, I, hope, I hope it was broken already. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And yeah. what are they doing? Is that just painted it's on? It's just it? painted on, yeah. Mm. Just kind of, kind of fits together nicely. Mm. That's for indoor bowls, mm. really, in a, an aristocratic house like Queensbury mm. House, which is um, uh, the house just right beside yeah. us here. And this is a, quite an amazing little object as well. Um, just dig it out of the bag here. It's in bits again, as it's most things are. already broken when you found it, obviously. Obviously, yeah. 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 And um, basically what this is, if I can find whatever way it goes back together again, uh, maybe... It's a Rubik's Cube. It is, it's, it's a puzzle, actually. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. It goes like that, right? So it's a very small vessel. You, can, you get, you get the yeah. idea of what it was. Yeah. And this is what they call a pearly pig, right? And it was a money box. Oh, really? But unfortunately, we didn't find any money in it. Oh. Um, I have seen one. Uh, found down in Leith, actually, mm. which was full of coins. Really? So it's funny, I think that's in so the Huntley House Museum. And what, it had a slot in the top? Like yeah, a just a little, piggy, yeah. little slot in the top yeah. and drop in your money. Mm. So that's called a pearly pig. Wow. They like, like the green glaze. Oh, they? yeah, it's, it's a kind of a lead-based glaze. Mm. Was well, that um, the most common or the only one? That's the only one they can do. Yeah, right, yeah, fair enough. Well, if you thought our journey through a thousand years and half an hour was just a little too quick, then you have a more leisurely browse on the internet. Why not start at the official parliament site, which is of course important in that it's developing as the new government develops. To get an aerial view of the site we visited today, the future home of the new parliament, once at the home page, click on parliament buildings and you can enlarge the photo of the site to give you a bird's eye view. This means you can see where Holyrood Palace is, where the castle is and so on, in relation to the new building and of course the Royal Mile. And while you're visiting Parliament, why not take a look at the Register of Interests of members of the Scottish Parliament? Just click on MSPs and choose the word Register of Interests, which is in bold. You can find out how much to get paid for the newspaper columns. So much for today's Parliament. Why not take a trip back in time and look more closely at the Palace of Holyrood House, which is such an important building in its heyday. If you just type in monarchy and then search. Top of your list should be British Monarchy Official Pages, the official website, apparently. They've got a brand new site about the Palace of Holyrood House, which provides a potted history of the palace from its establishment, first as an abbey, providing accommodation to visiting royals, to the building of the palace next door, mentioning all the royal occupants who've left their mark, whatever that means. Well, we certainly learned a lot about Canongate area of Edinburgh, and if you want to familiarise yourself with other parts of the city, take a trip to an online travel guide. Type in Edinburgh Guides, and the first thing you'll see is... <laughs> the Edinburgh pub tour, but don't be distracted by that. Scroll down to the fourth entry and you can ponder on these words about Edinburgh penned by Sir Walter Scott. Where are the huge... No, I'll leave the accent there. Where the huge castle holds its state and all the steep slope down whose ridgy back heaves to the sky piled deep and mossy, close and high my own romantic town. Terrible. And finally, those lovely parliamentary project people have a website all of their own. This tells you all about the history of the Scottish Parliament. It has extracts from old acts, and you could become involved in their research yourself. The historians have put out a worldwide appeal for Scottish Acts of Parliament. Apparently, they turn up in the strangest of places. All these addresses are on the History Fix site, the address of which is on your screen. Time to see how the volunteers have got on. Hi, Bob. Hi, Jackie. Hi. Well, Bob, what exciting things have you found out for us today? I uh, found out about Queensbury House, mm. um, who owned it, when it was mm. built, etc. Some juicy stories about children being roasted in an oven, mm. things like that. Um, really? Yes. <laughs> Apparently the uh, second Duke of Queensbury had a lunatic son that was kept locked Did up really? in here, yeah, kept locked up in a, a bedroom upstairs, and when they were out one particular day, he escaped from his prison and was found roasting a servant boy in one of the ovens in the kitchen. So. Great place, Scotland, oh, eh? Yes. <laughs> had him for Sunday lunch, so yeah. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit of a chequered past the, mm. the, the house. Um, it was owned by the Queensbury family until the Act of Union, and yeah. they were major proponents of the Act of yeah. Union. And there, uh, afterwards, uh, it became owned by the army, right. it became a hospital, and it became more of a dilapida dilapidated state as, as yeah. time went on. Did it, did it look after um, drunken women for a while as well? Did I read that somewhere? I don't know about that. I never came across that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Jackie, what have you found out about the Acts of the Scottish Parliament then? 
Well, um, first of all, they were well in advance of the English Parliament by actually... Oh, were they? Yes, they wrote in the vernacular, i.e. Scots, instead of Latin, and they wrote in books instead of the long rolls. So they couldn't do Latin, isn't that's why? Oh, no, oh, no, we were just well, we were just well in advance. And also there's quite a lot missing, and they're turning up in the strangest places, like Lambeth Palace and places in France and Germany and so on because they sent these sort of things over on what trade missions it? and things yeah. like that. So they're hoping that any, everyone will look into their attic and find out if they've got a Act of Parliament stuff somewhere. <laughs> yeah, that's very, very good indeed. Well, let's see if the new Scottish Parliament creates as much interest in the next millennium. Thanks, guys, for fixing that Thank history you. for us. Well, that's all for this week. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.